All right, hi everyone. My name is Anna. I am from the Microsoft Tech community and I am joined by Jethro. So Jethro, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> yes. There's an That'll English way and a Dutch way. Uh, yes. It's too hard to uh, explain to English speaking people how to pronounce it properly in yep. Dutch, but Jethro is perfect. Okay, perfect. So why don't you tell everybody um, who you are and where you're from and what you're currently, uh, what your day job is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jethro Sagers. I'm a program director at SkySync um, and I really focus on helping people getting onboarded in um, Office 365, um, Teams, everything pretty much that has to do with collaboration and content. Um, and I really help our partners understanding how change management is done properly, how user adoption mm -hmm. is done properly, but also how technology can be a benefit in mm -hmm. the whole process and not necessarily a blocker. Um, helping them understand what the differences are, what the, the measure for success are when it comes to user adoption and change management. So, and I'm originally from Belgium. Cool. Um, so I do try to combine the whole American vibe with the <laughs> European culture. Um, <laughs> Which, which works pretty well. Sometimes I do have to change my sense of humor a little bit, but <laughs> it is, it's going well. Is the Belgian sense of humor a little bit more dry? Is that? Um, we were just more, more serious about certain things. Okay. Sometimes we were like, it's not always obvious when it's a joke. <laughs> let me rephrase it that way. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. You might, might need to let it sink in a little bit. Yes. Um, so right now, we're actually here in my office. It's actually a rare occurrence I'm ever in Seattle, I know, since been on the road for mm -hmm. Microsoft Ignite the Tour. Um, and so you relocated from Belgium yes. to be in Seattle. Yeah. Yep. Um, I live in Woodenville, which is amazing. Yeah. Lots of wine. Lots of uh, wine. Good restaurants. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I work 100% remote. So. My life really evolves around uh, collaboration on a remote way. Mm -hmm. um, our main office is in Ann Arbor, uh, Detroit, Michigan. So I always have to work from a distance, get yeah. uh, collaboration with my peers. Um, so yeah, even for us, it's sometimes like, how are we going to do this? Which technology are we going to use? How do we get everybody on board? So mm -hmm. that, that can be a challenge sometimes. Yeah, so you're kind of living the modern workplace in yes. real life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was, it, I, I had to adjust to it. My previous job was here in Bellevue, so I was always in the office. Mm. And then it, they offered me a fully remote job, and I was like, now I have to like create an office at home, and yeah. I need to get like a desk. I didn't even have a desk at home, so I was like, <laughs> okay, let's just give this a try. And right now, it's it's actually pretty amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take for you to feel like I'm comfortable with this working situation? Five to six months, easily. Okay. It was, it was... Especially because you have to start building your own routine. I when I say my commute is literally from my top floor to my bottom floor, it's <laughs> it's just one stair. Yeah. Um, but it's like it's a mindset. Um, it actually yeah. started working better when I really designed a whole office for myself, where I could literally at five p.m. close the door. Yeah. And my day job was done. Yeah. Um, instead of like having computers everywhere, mm -hmm. so I really had to make sure it was like. There needs to be some kind of barrier, yeah, um, and, and that is going very well now. Yeah, very yeah. cool. So I want to segue to the topic mm -hmm. at hand, which is around modern workplace, Microsoft Three Hundred and Sixty Five, mm -hmm. driving user adoption there. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you do that in the work that you do um, in, in your yeah. yeah in so job. yeah, I always try to, especially with people that are partners always try to identify is like, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. What are the services that you're going to make available? Um, if it's OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint Online, that's that's fine. But mm -hmm. first of all, like what type of services are you going to implement? How are you going to make sure that everybody is aware mm -hmm. of what you're going to be doing? But also what are the different steps within your plans? Yeah. Uh, when I deal with partners, I see quite a lot, like change management so many days in their project plan. and I always ask them like, how does that look like? Yeah. What are you going to? What are the necessary steps that, or what are the steps that you're going to take to make that change management mm. um, actually into success? And then they start breaking it up. Um, but what really happens a lot is where they have the concept. It's not an IT project. It's mm. not driven by IT. Mm. Is where they don't see the dependencies with other stuff. Right? Mm. It's like your training. Yeah. How you're going to do your training? And and we especially within IT. 
Uh, we kind of believe sometimes that everybody is a good trainer. That's yeah. one. Um, that everybody can be trained in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, that's two. And you're going to see that a lot of people just disconnect from the project because they don't feel that they have the right training or mm. the, the methodology of the training is not really something that is attached to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a strong believer when I was doing trainings a long time ago because I was actually in education a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand what type of people or what type of learners you have within your group. Mm, Every there's, there's like multiple assessments that you can do. I love to do a self-assessment for everybody where just based on a few questions, it will actually tell you what the preferred work form is to get somebody to, to teach something. Yeah. Um, and that really helps with them. Some people just want to dive in. Mm. They want to see teams. They will click on these buttons. They will see what happens. And that's how they like to learn. Mm. Some people are afraid. Some yeah. people want you to tell them and guide them. and. Yeah really from an emotional perspective, start to be invested in it. But yeah. once they have it, they have it. Mm. Two completely different ways of teaching something, two completely ways of somebody learning something. Mm. And one works really well with the one, but not with the other. So yeah. you can't generalize that user training in mm. the same way. Yeah. So that is very important is that people realize like, how do I identify first what type of learner they are? Yeah. What are the different workforms that I can use to actually train? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, one thing that is really coming up right now mm -hmm. is just in time learning. Yeah. Where a lot of people actually are like, I want to know how to do something when I need to do something. Mm. Right. So, um, like, for example, if you take teams and you want to start collaborating on a document together, um, you, there's tools out there and software out there now. Yeah where you can say, this is how you start a document. This is how you collaborate together. This is how you add it into a conversation. Mm. Um, so they're not overwhelmed by all the functionalities of Teams or whatever service in Microsoft 365 you have all at once, but they actually get what they need. So in this way, software is actually helping them in really to achieve <clears throat> in achieving what they actually need to know when they need to do it. Yeah. Um, the second thing that I always bring up with our partners as well is use use real data, right? Mm. Um, what we see a lot, and it's sometimes it's in every course that you follow, I remember doing like SharePoint courses where there was like really mock-up data almost. Yeah. Um, when you do that with people in a real work experience, they will be like, that's not what I do on a daily basis. Yeah. Like, I don't use these documents. So <clears throat> what is very important is that you make it real, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to start redesigning, for example, a process, make that process in Teams, make that process in Flow, whatever, let yeah. them experience it. Because at that point, you're going to get feedback. Mm -hmm. They will be invested in making it into success. Mm -hmm. And because it's recognizable, they will actually be like, oh, yes, of course. I want to do it this way, mm. this is more efficient, and suddenly it's not, here's the workflow mm -hmm. that we build for you, mm -hmm. go and do it. So change management sometimes goes further into uh, the design as well, mm -hmm. um, user adoption the same way, mm -hmm. and sometimes it doesn't even have to be that difficult. I think that when we look at very um, easy to step in services like a OneDrive, for mm -hmm. example, or a SharePoint Online. Mm -hmm. We do this. We have the same problem. We're mm -hmm. never using the documents that they were would be using. Yeah. And the problem sometimes is that we don't have software that can do that. And that's mm -hmm. what we or what I like to do with my partners as well is like, now that you have certain software that can do that, make sure that your IT or your product or whatever migration tool you use is supportive mm -hmm. of your change management and not a blocker yeah um, and, and that is very important is that make it real make it comprehensible by using real content or real data or real processes or whatever you're trying to do mm -hmm. that a person who is trying to like see what is the value in it for me mm -hmm. recognizes immediately yeah very cool so you've touched on a lot of interesting topics mm -hmm. that I want to dive a little sure. deeper into so I'm thinking about those sort of learning um, preferences yes. that people have. Now, you talked about people who, some people are very receptive to learning new processes, mm -hmm. things that will, you know, help them be more productive, but there are certain people who just are very resistant to change, yes. right? So in that scenario where people have that fear of 
potentially failing when it comes to adopting a new process Mm -hmm. or even just doing something different to what they've been doing for the last five, six, seven years. How do you approach approach, those types of scenarios? Yeah, absolutely. So it's always about step-by-step and not overwhelming people, right? Is um, when you always, when I do sessions uh, about like change management or user adoption, Mm -hmm. I always give the example that in 2011 when Office 365 came out, it was very easy. You had four services and that was it. Yeah. Uh, right now, I actually lost count on how many services <laughs> we actually have. Oh. That's only Office 365. Right. Let alone if you're going into Microsoft 365. Mm-hmm. So I think that is sometimes a problem with people is mm-hmm. that uh, they want to educate everything mm-hmm. of Microsoft 365. Yeah. And even within a specific service, educate everything mm-hmm. of that specific service. I think people who need time, people who um, are a little bit resistant of change management is because they don't understand why that change is coming. So that is crucial that they feel, oh, even for me Mm -hmm. as a first line worker or uh, an executive assistant or whatever their role is, that there is a value in it for them. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is really Slimming it down mm-hmm. to really the essentials of their job mm-hmm. and making sure they're aware of this is what's going to happen, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is why we're doing it. Look, here's your data. If I click, 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 do this, mm-hmm. this is what you're going to get. Yeah. Or ask them what is a pain point that you used to have that you yeah. just, you found a way around it. You know how to get by, yeah. Yeah. but it's not efficient. And then they always come up with some kind of scenario mm-hmm. and then show them how they can do it better yeah. without the workaround mm-hmm. and the new service. Yeah. So that's one. And what you're going to start seeing is those people are going to start being active participants in the process. Mm-hmm. And what I always think is very interesting is the aha moment is when they're like, but I could do this as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then they start actively thinking about certain things they have today mm-hmm. and how they can use actually the service within Microsoft 365 to, to solve that. Mm-hmm. So once you're there, it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. And that is going to be crucial is I think it's always very interesting and dangerous at the same time when I see a project plan with like a fixed date on for change management. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. We can we have like a gut feeling how long it should be taking. Yeah. But that's one of the project phases that in my opinion has to be as flexible as possible. Mm. Uh, you can't tell people, well, we had five days, we're at four days and a half. We know that 90% doesn't really get it. Mm. Let's stop. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, so you you mentioned flexibility. Yes. So it sounds like when it comes to driving user adoption, would it be uh, almost destined to fail if you tried to drive user adoption across an entire organization? Absolutely. So you have to start with small teams. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have to you have to start where it makes sense, and okay. it's a very vague answer. But pretty much what I mean by that is you're going to get questions and if and I always tell people when you want to start doing change management with like for example Microsoft 365 go through your help desk mm-hmm. look at what problems arise on a daily basis or even a weekly basis mm-hmm. right you mm-hmm. uh, there's like a framework for it where you can call it it's once it, if it happens once it's an incident and when it keeps happening it becomes a problem yeah have you identified certain problems where you know Microsoft 365 is going to be a solution? Mm-hmm. Implement that, Yeah. right? Go back to the people who actually notified the help desk of that problem and say, look, we couldn't fix it at the time. Mm-hmm. We've implemented a specific workflow, a way of collaborating again, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and start there. And suddenly there's immediately a value they get back mm-hmm. by implementing something new. I've, I've seen a few of your videos and it always comes back for like when are users um, invested in change and when there's something in it for them. Yeah. What that is can vary big time from type of group that you're working with, department, type of users, that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. it's always interesting to see what is the problem, how we're going to fix it and get them to that aha moment mm-hmm. where you're like, 
oh, so now you fix that problem. We have a similar problem. It's a little bit different, yeah. but we think the same technology could be used, mm. and then you get them going. So it sounds like you need to find those quick wins and really evangelize mm. them to get other people to also change their behavior. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. and the quick wins are sometimes difficult to identify because. Yeah. It's not like there's a label on it that says, hey, can be fixed quickly by implementing flow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So that's where I like to communicate with IT, mm -hmm. um, where it's like what types of inf or what types of problem are being, uh, being submitted into your help desk? What are the things that you immediately feel there's going to be an impact? Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different because I always look at it from a partner perspective as an MSP and, and an ISP where we're like, okay, how can we make sure that our customer sees the value that we bring as well? Mm -hmm. So it's not just an internal uh, change management thing, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a lot to be said about analyzing your help desk, analyzing, um, like, let me give you a mm -hmm. real, real small example. If they're always complaining about their mailbox being full, yeah, you could go to Exchange Online. If they're always complaining about, hey, we're never finding the attachments that we need, SharePoint Online, Teams, if, they're, uh, if they want to do uh, Voice over IP, Skype for Business, there's always so many things that yeah. you can see just looking at what are the things that people are struggling with. Mm. So you mentioned just-in-time learning mm -hmm. yes. and looking at the support calls and figuring yeah. out where there are actual problems where it versus a one-off mm -hmm. incident. So how do you sort of figure that out between, okay, so I can see that people are trying to, in order for me to drive effective user adoption, mm -hmm. I need to get them where it's hurting them right now. Yes. So would you recommend that you look at the support calls and figure out, okay, this is starting to be a really hot issue we need to be solving this and trying to figure out with this group of people mm -hmm. this is what we should be trying to drive in terms of behavior change yeah absolutely yeah. i think just looking at the help desk right and the tickets and, and your, your problems that come in yeah um, you can actually already identify these are things that everybody's struggling with yeah. it's just something that comes across the board mm -hmm. and then most what will happen is either people we're waiting for it because they were actually anticipating um, uh, onboarding in Microsoft 365 or they were starting to make budget available to create a custom application mm. or whatever it is, mm. that's an ideal time where to start saying, okay, this is uh, something that we can implement. Mm. Additionally, what you're also going to see is when you see people asking specific questions, right? Um, for example, they're in Teams, they can't find anything. What do we do? We, can, mm. we call help desk. Mm -hmm. Help desk at that point can be actually a catalyst for your change management team, for your training team, mm -hmm. where they can say, hey, I get all these different questions and it's always about how to attach a document to a conversation in Teams. Yeah. If we have where the conversation is certain in Teams, why don't we add a just-in-time learning module where we, ex where we explain to them how you do it mm, so mm. next time when they have to do it they actually can watch a video and it's yeah. like 30 seconds it doesn't have to take long yeah they watch 30 seconds and now they know exactly what is going on mm. the cool thing is if you like use like dedicated icons start people start to pick up that there's like a video behind it yeah and when they're in a new platform or in a new functionality they can like, oh so, wait there's a video here let's yeah. share yeah and suddenly you're going to start seeing people being on their own trying to look for what's new, mm. what's available. Yeah. Hmm, what does that mean, adding a tab here? What kind of tabs can I add? Yeah. Um, so again, it's, it's really like understanding where they're having issues with mm -hmm. and then making that content available. But at the same time, I, I like to use the analogy where you plant a little seed and then it starts growing, growing, growing. Mm. And once it's a full form tree, you're going to see that people actually will make or will ask you to do mm. certain things because they start to see the value, because yeah. they see what the service can do. So if I was to paint a really uh, great picture of what how this would work in, in real life, you would not only have those videos that would show people how to use those features, mm -hmm. but to use real data from that company Absolutely. to show how they would do that. Have you seen any examples from other organizations who've done that sort of um, self-service training really well? 
So one of the, the the company that I started when I was still in Belgium actually is doing that right now mm. with their customers, where they use the adoption and the usage reports, and every month they go back to their customers and see like, look, this is what you currently are using. We feel that for your organization, and because they have that strategic relationship with that organization, where they can go in and say like, we think we should do this specifically. So. Mm -hmm. um, Additionally, there's always, you have to have multiple training sessions, right? Yeah. Like I said, people learn in different ways. Mm. So some people will need that foundation first before yeah. they will go into that just-in-time learning. Mm -hmm. um, but th these, there's a lot of stuff where you can just say, what are people doing, right? You can see all the audit logs nowadays where you can see what has happened on a mailbox, what has happened in Teams, what are people doing. Yeah. And just by analyzing that and what we've done is we we, we pulled it actually in Power BI where we can actually okay. see certain things. It's yeah. like who is actually working together on that specific channel, for mm. example. And then you see that certain channels are very active and certain yeah. channels are not. And then you can start analyzing who is in these channels, mm. right? which people are not ready to make that leap yet. What yeah. do they need? Yeah. And if you know, going back to what type of learner they are, yeah. you know that those people are all similar in a type of learning. Yeah. It means that your training needs to be adjusted a little bit so you can mm. cover these as well. Yeah, so I mean, it's important to think about what type of learner people are, but you have to also think about what type of teacher people are too, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, some people, and I think every teacher is that way, has a preference of certain work forms that they love to use. Yeah. But it is important that that's that's for example when you go into like an, an education when you're a high school teacher or a professor or whatever that where they teach you like to vary between those different work forms to match every single student and have like okay you're more of an emotional distant person that wants to observe first, right. we will include a work from you. Yeah. Are you somebody that wants to just dive in and just explore everything? Yeah. There's a work for for you as well. So mm -hmm. some people will have to go through different work forms to be at the, the, at the same level mm -hmm. of training, let's call it. But as a teacher, unfortunately, you're not there for your own pleasure. Right. You have to get to a specific goal. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as if you are really invested in uh, the education of your end users as well yeah. it does give you a good feeling when you see that people are starting like make connecting the dots and really start to be active uh, in um, their questions about what the service can do mm -hmm. that's when you know you got them yeah and that's when you, you really feel like yes what i did even that it was not my preferred work for definitely pull those people uh, on board mm -hmm. um, otherwise they're just going to fade out and die pretty yeah. much and go back to their own old ways how they were collaborating and that's mm -hmm. definitely not what you want okay well this has been a really great conversation do you have any final thoughts for the people on on the Twitters <laughs> sure absolutely uh, my final thoughts would be is even if you're not a teacher try to educate a little bit about the different learning uh, forms and about the different learning styles there's mm -hmm. some really amazing material out there mm -hmm. um, and then finally it's it's about making sure that it's recognizable get software um, that actually supports you in that mm -hmm. don't pick um, like a migration tool or whatever that just does whatever it needs to do make sure there's like a real that they understand what change management need mm -hmm. and that is attached to them. Okay, and you recently wrote a blog on just-in-time learning too. I actually wrote two blogs. One oh. is just just-in-time learning is one of them. Yeah. Uh, the second one is also about the learning styles. Okay. So on my blog, there's actually even a self-assessment okay. where you can just, it's a small PDF, you've just answered the questions and yeah. at the bottom it will tell you it's, it's, it's a matrix, right? So there's four different learning styles mm -hmm. and you can kind of shift uh, in between them. Okay. Um, but it will give you an idea of what type of learner you are. Cool. I'm, I'm going to check that yeah, out. Totally. Um, where can people find that blog? JethroSigers.com. Um, and all the links are there. All the downloads are there. So. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you for the conversation. Yeah, totally. Thank you for joining me in my office today. Absolutely. Um, if you have any questions for Jethro, you can find him on Twitter. Yes. What's your Twitter handle? You see it. Okay. So we will, we will put it, we'll we will put put it in, in the comments. We'll put it in the comments so you yes. can find it. 
Um, but yeah, if there's, and uh, are you going to be joining us on any of the tour stops? I would love to. Um, <laughs> yeah, the problem is with living in Seattle, we don't we don't do conferences here anymore. I know our biggest one is in Orlando, so yeah. we don't have anything in the U.S. right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we can potentially get you over to Europe so you can get back yeah, to Belgium. Would, maybe I would love to. All right, cool, yeah. awesome. Well, thank you for joining me, Jethro. You're thank welcome. you for the conversation, and we'll talk to you guys online. Thank you so much.